welcome and come again, please. I hope uh, you will. This is a thing we do regularly and it's a great way for us to learn, all of us, and explore different things. So I just want to say a little bit about what we're going to talk about tonight and I want to introduce uh, Dr. Judith Orloff and then um, she'll speak and we can go back and forth, ask some questions and if uh, you want you can participate, we encourage that. Uh, as you probably know or maybe don't know, <laughs> I'm a medical doctor, as is Dr. <laughs> Judith Orloff, okay? <laughs> We're both medical doctors and we uh, are trained in a very rational, left uh, brain way to think about things. And uh, in my entire training in medicine, I never uh, heard anything about intuition. It's only when you start uh, practicing that you realize that uh, good doctors are also intuitive doctors. They make all the rational decisions, they go through the histories and physicals like anyone else, but then um, they use their intuition also, both for diagnosis and for treatment. If they're good doctors, they always do that. And uh, for most of us, it comes kind of naturally, just through observation, practicing, uh, seeing patients, listening to them, you start to listen to an inner voice that says, uh, uh, don't do this treatment even though the book says this is the treatment you should be doing. Or this patient uh, shouldn't go for surgery because something may happen and you don't know exactly uh, why that, that's being uh, said to you or where it's coming from. And uh, as in my early days in practice, I also learned that sometimes patients are extremely intuitive in that you'll give them all the right advice and they will not follow it. And, um, <laughs> and they turn out to be right. They turn out to be absolutely right. So, you know, gradually I became kind of sensitive to this notion that there's a form of intelligence that is uh, seemingly beyond the rational mind. Our rational mind thinks um, in linear terms, cause-effect relationships and uh, serves us well if we are doing science. Uh, but if you ask even scientists, basic scientists, the major discoveries in science are not made through rational thought. They are made through intuitive insights. And intuitive insights are actually um, quantum leaps in thinking. Now, everyone in this room has probably heard the word uh, quantum leap. It's a, such a common phrase in our, in our language today. Um, originally described, a quantum leap in physics is the phenomenon where you have a subatomic particle in this location and then you suddenly find it in this location and it doesn't go through the space in between. That's what the original quantum leap is in physics. So let's say I'm here right now, and then I'm here, but I didn't go through the space in between. Now how could that be? It's like saying I'm here right now, and suddenly I'm at the back of the room, and I didn't have to go through this space in between. I'm in New York, and then I'm in New Delhi, but I didn't have to go through Europe or through Japan, okay. That's the original <laughs> quantum leap. And it is turning out that those who look at intuition and creativity, because creativity is an extension of intuition, are actually using the model of the quantum leap to explain it. A quantum leap is, as I said, a discontinuous jump it's non-algorithmic. In a computer program, for example, you, when you program a computer, you program it algorithmically, which means this proposition leads to this proposition, leads to this proposition, leads to this proposition, on and on and on. So if you look at Euclidean geometry, for example, it's algorithmic. If you know theorem one, then you'll know theorem two. If you know theorem two, you'll know theorem three. 
if you know theorem 3, you'll know theorem 4. A non-algorithmic system is where you have proposition 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then suddenly from 6 to 102 with nothing in between. And in fact, there's a theorem in mathematics called Gödel's theorem. It's uh, described originally by a German mathematician. And Gödel's theorem states, and it's one of the most fundamental principles in mathematics right now, cutting edge. Gödel's theorem says that if you have a sufficiently elaborate system of mathematical principles, then you'll find in that system a proposition that is not supported by the system. So let me restate it. Gödel's theorem says that if you have a sufficiently elaborate system of propositions in a mathematical system, then you will find in the system a proposition that's not supported by the system. And when the mathematician looks at it, he says, you know, it makes intuitive sense, but I can't explain it by mathematical logic. And just pay attention to this. Mathematics is the language of nature. You know, mathematics is how God's mind is thinking and orchestrating the universe right now. Even as we speak, there was, you know, there was an interview of Stephen Hawking on Larry King a little while ago. And uh, Stephen Hawking was asked by Larry King, so what's your concept of God? And um, La Stephen Hawking said, God is the ultimate mathematician, <laughs> the embodiment of all the f mathematical and physical laws that structure the workings of the universe. Now, it, isn't it strange that these mathematical formulas, which are just symbols that occur to us in our own consciousness, actually are the same symbols that express how the universe works. And mathematics is pure creativity in that if you really understand Gödel's theorem, the mathematical laws, they follow algorithms, which means rational propositions up to a certain point, and then they suddenly take quantum leaps of creativity in between there's no algorithmic linear progression. So in order to take that quantum leap in intuition and creativity, the mathematical mind has to go into a domain of awareness that's not in the mind, that's not part of the mind, or at least not part of the ego mind, not part of the rational mind, not a part of the individual mind. It might be part of the universal mind, that sub-manifest order of being, that sub-manifest uh, infinite order of being that is, um, is orchestrating the activity of the universe. So earlier, before we came down, Judith was saying intuition is actually God's mind. And if there's anything that interferes with God's mind uh, in our own consciousness, it must be our ego mind. And, you know, one of the problems uh, that people have, at least I have when I'm dealing with intuitives, um, is um, you wonder, you know, you wonder, <laughs> is this God's mind speaking or is this ego mind speaking? There's a problem. It is, you know, and uh, when I was, uh, when I was, um, a child, I used to read Sherlock Holmes stories. How many people have uh, read Sherlock Holmes stories? That's all? <laughs> Again, how many people have read Sherlock Holmes? More, so, more. you know, of course, uh, Sherlock Holmes is the ultimate example, isn't he, of, of um, intuitive uh, deduction that seems to follow intuitive thought. You know. It's always saying, coming to conclusions, and he finally, when he finally explains it, you understand that actually he's a keen observer, and then those keen observations, that heightened sense of observation, that heightened sense of awareness, puts together things contextually, but not necessarily rationally. I remember reading this great uh, uh, joke uh, a while ago, you know, uh, Sherlock Holmes works with Dr. Watson. And so Dr. Watson is always amazed at his amazing intuitive abilities. And 
one day he comes into the room and Sherlock Holmes says, Aha, my dear Watson, I see you have already started wearing your winter underwear. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Watson says, Marvelous, my dear Holmes, marvelous. How did you know? And Sherlock Holmes says, Elementary, my dear Watson, elementary. <laughs> You've forgotten to put on your pants. <laughs> A heightened sense of awareness. <laughs> a heightened sense of awareness is what intuition is. And lots of people also say women are more sensitive than men, uh, and probably that's true. And I'm always, and I'm going to ask you about this, uh, I've always kind of rationalized that by thinking that women are more in touch with their bodies. Uh, biologically, evolutionarily, they've had to nurture a human being in their body for for nine months before. Not all women. Not all women. <laughs> yes, but you know, <laughs> biologically anyway, they're programmed to listen to their bodies more. And to be in touch with your body, to be fully present in your body is also to eavesdrop maybe on the environment because your body is picking signals from the environment all the time. So intuition is... Uh, Non-algorithmic, contextual, relational, uh, wise, nourishing, does not have a windows orientation, is beyond linear cause-effect relationships, and uh, I hope we can all begin to culture it. Um, I think I'm beginning to do that sometimes. But I also worry about it, because you worry because you know, how can, how can you be a hundred percent sure that the voice that you're listening to is genuine or not? And that's uh, something I want to ask you. You know, and of course, we, you know, we all indulge in projections many times. We see the world as we see ourselves. When I have this experience, I'm uh, traveling frequently all over the country. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to New York early in the morning at six. And these days when I, I'm switching planes, walking across airports, because my book is all over the place, people will recognize me and they'll come up to me and somebody will say, Oh, Dr. Chopra, um, you look so tired. Are you taking care of yourself? <laughs> and, you know, I'll start feeling tired for five minutes. <laughs> and then five minutes later, somebody else will come up and they say, what are you doing? You look so amazingly fresh. <laughs> are you meditating all the time? So it takes a while to realize that, you know, when people say those things, they're actually talking about themselves and not about you. You know, how we look at ourselves is how we also look at the world. And frequently our projection interferes with, um, with our intuition. If you find yourself being defensive before you're criticized, if you find that you have uh, uh, extreme opinions about things, if you find that you tend to use verbal formulas, if you find that you think you're frequently misunderstood, if you ask others for their opinions and get upset if you don't like what they say, <laughs> if you feel threatened by authority figures, if you finish sentences for people, then you're probably not very intuitive. <laughs> You've got to start getting rid of those projections. So anyway, those are my brief comments. I want to introduce Dr. Orloff. She's first of all an MD. She's a board certified um, psychiatrist. She um, has a private practice in psychiatry in Los Angeles. She's an assistant clinical professor in psychiatry at UCLA and on the staff at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Um, she um, is trained in neu neuropsychiatry psychiatry, and practices at the Neuropsychiatric Institute. Uh, she's training medical residents to be intuitive and uh, she's been very uh, well received by, um, by critics um, and uh, commentators on books. Uh, she is the author of the current book, uh, which is called um, Dr. Judith Orloff's uh, Guide to Intuitive Healing, Five Steps to Physical, Emotional, and Sexual Wellness. And your last book was called? Second Sight. Second Sight. 
and was also about medical intuition or more than that it, about it intuition was, in it general. was more coming into intuition all the struggles and fears and triumphs and okay. coming out as an intuitive second sight so her books will be available by the way after the lecture if you want to uh, get one and have her sign them and she's giving great lectures and workshops all over the country and this evening when she came up um, you know to meet me upstairs she said to me that um, uh, Coleman Barks sends you his love. So I said, oh, <laughs> Coleman Barks, how do you know Coleman Barks? She said, well, he's my sweetheart. Uh, now, I hadn't been intuitive enough to just by her demeanor guess that. Uh, but you've been to some of these satsangs where we've had Coleman, and he's just an amazing guy and has done some great stuff with Rumi and actually she's doing some workshops with Coleman Marx on Rumi, Intuition and Healing. Uh, put it that all together. So I'm going to ask you, how did you get involved in, in the work that you do? You're a psychiatrist. <laughs> Give us a little background and then thought, tell us about your book. I thought you were going to ask something else. I said, how did you get involved with Coleman? <laughs> well, you're not very intuitive if you thought I was going to ask you. Get involved with intuition? Yeah. <laughs> we'll ask about Coleman later. <laughs> oh, uh, as, as long as I can remember from the time I was born, I always had a sense of God. I've been really blessed with that. I, I've never not felt God. And I've been one of these people. It's been an incredible thing for me. And through this knowing, I grew up as a little girl in Beverly Hills. And I always had this sense of, of, of God, of spirit. And I always had this voice that spoke to me, uh, that told me about things uh, when I was a little girl. I would have premonitions. Um, oftentimes when I was a little girl, it was about scary things. I would predict deaths. I was always very good at predicting death. I always did. I still am. Yeah, it's a very uh, beautiful thing to be able to pick up intuitively, to pick up death and then be able to know about that. But as a child, that scared me. I'd pick up deaths. I would always know if an earthquake was about to happen. I would, my parents would bring their friends home and I would say things like, I don't trust this person. And they would say, well, how can you say that? You've never even met them. And from an intuitive standpoint, it doesn't matter if you've never met anyone before. If you get, it's particularly with children. I mean, children are so infinitely creative. When they're around someone, they sense energy, they get it. Intuition is a transmission. It comes through very quickly. It's not like the rational mind where you have to analyze. It comes through, it comes through the body. Children know. And I knew certain things. And I made a lot of predictions when I was little. Uh, and I, when my grandfather died, I had a dream uh, the night before he died that he came to me and to tell me that he loved me very much and that he was about to die and so I had this message that came through and I remember running into my parents room in the dark and telling them oh just had a dream about grandpa and he came in and he said he was about to die and my parents said oh no you're just having a nightmare that's all and then walked me back and tucked me into bed and the next morning my aunt called from the east coast to let us know that my grandfather had died and so very early on I had a very direct experience that visitation was possible and that when you love someone very much often the intuition is amplified and because he was so important to me and out of an act of love he came to me in a dream as a little girl I was very little and he came to me um, I was innocent so I was able to receive it innocence is so important in terms of being able to receive intuition the mind the ego stands in the way but when you get in the mind of the child and you get in that sense of innocence of the heart and many children are there it hasn't been squashed yet uh, or bludgeoned out of them really and that's what happens in our culture terrible violence is inflicted on intuition and creativity at a very young age and so I had all of this deep interconnection with my grandfather with other people being able to read them and finally my parents who were both physicians were so exasperated with all of my negative predictions they just said um, never mention another one of your predictions again at home never and so I was forbidden to talk about my intuitions when I was a little girl and I grew up believing there was something wrong with me that I was somehow able to know about these things I was able to predict and cause them and I grew up um, having to keep these experiences a secret I became very quiet within myself and um, I grew up thinking there was something wrong with me and the only connecting point and this still is my most powerful connecting point I would always climb on top of our roof and look up at the night sky 
there's just something about the night sky that has always connected me with what is the most deep within me. And the way the stars are, the, the darkness, the beautiful night sky, it was something very primal. And so, um, you know, I didn't have what that is, what's going on over there. I mean, she is totally resonating with her child, heart to heart. Her energy is open. Um, she's communicating. She's giving that child total permission to be. I mean, I can sense. The I can child see is that. saying, "I agree." Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true. You watch certain. I mean, it's a very beautiful thing to watch her. But I didn't have that as a child, and so I was told not to express, not to talk about my dreams. Dreaming has always been one of my most potent forms of connecting intuitively. And so, when the '60s rolled around, and I had a chance to get involved with drugs. I got very heavily involved with drugs for a few years in an attempt to squash all of my abilities because I just was not comfortable with them. And I didn't want to be around you and be able to pick things up about you. I didn't want that. I didn't want to go into places like shopping malls and pick up all the energy there and walk out uh, exhausted. I didn't know what was happening that in crowded places such as this um, that there's a phenomenon called intuitive empathy where if you're an empath and you know how to sense energy sometimes you get around crowded places where all the energy fields intersect and you absorb it. And so if, if you ever have a, a feeling where you get exhausted in, in crowds, most likely you're an empath. And I didn't know what was happening as a child. This was an intuitive phenomenon. It's very real. It's related to our health in the here and now. We have to be aware that we sense energy, we absorb it, and how to work with that in our lives um, as a way of, of really um, working with intuition. But I didn't know this. And my parents said, oh, you're, you're overly sensitive or you don't have a thick enough skin, the kind of zingers that parents of that era can just throw at you and just diminish intuition instantly. When somebody says that to you, you're not you're overly sensitive. Everything in you shuts down unless you're very strong and you say, No, you're wrong. But most children would never say that. And so I ran from my intuition for, you know, a couple of years, very heavily involved with drugs. And then you know, I'm a big believer in protection around us. I believe that everyone is born here with a certain amount of protection. Um, you can call it angels, you can call it ancestors, whatever whatever it is, or some mysterious goodness. That, that surrounds us from the moment we're born. And because we can't see it with our, our rational mind um, and our intuition isn't, de- isn't developed enough to sense it, we often don't feel the reality of this around us. But I've, I've seen evidence of this guidance work in my life over and over again. And when I was going down this very destructive path as a teenager, my guidance came in and it helped me. And I had a series of events. I had a, a near-death experience when I was 16 um, in the middle of all of this um, drug taking uh, where I, I met some guy at a party one night who I was attracted to and I jumped in a little car in Austin Mini Cooper and went up to the top of uh, Tuna Canyon which is up in Malibu Canyon and we were talking, talking and weren't paying much attention to the road and all of a sudden um, I remember smelling burnt rubber and the car started tumbling over the cliff it was this huge, you know, huge abyss, you know, very huge. And as the car was tumbling, I had this dual awareness where I was going over the cliff, but I was also catapulted into this amazing tunnel that so many of people have spoken about since then. And it was uh, kind of the color of this room, kind of a little bit more gray. It was blue-gray for me. And all of the, the atoms were whirling at enormous speeds, and my substance of my body changed to resonate with the substance of the tunnel, and I believe that's what kept me sane. And my body was in this change state until it landed. And then I came back into my body and I was just hardly harmed at all. I was remarkably unscathed. And it was after this experience, and people always say, well, what happened to the guy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that was really nice. <laughs> you know, it's funny, sometimes people come into your life just for this brief moment to experience a certain thing, then they're gone. I can't even remember his last name. And, and he was safe too, but because I wasn't talking about my experience, I didn't sit him down and say, God, I went to this tunnel. I just kept it inside. And, but it was after that night. Sometimes we have these peak experiences in our lives, these peak psychic experiences, and our guidance comes in very strongly, our protection, and then life begins to shift. It's this invisible shift that happens. And the shift that happened for me was that after this, my parents were so distraught that they forced me to go see a psychiatrist. (laughs) 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 I don't know if you find this 
55, but you look back on your life and you see this incredible plan. I know. You do, but when you're living through it, it just it seems almost incomprehensible. The conspiracy of improbabilities. Improb- exactly, exactly. Who would have ever thought I would have become a psychiatrist? I mean, it was nothing I wanted to do. In my mind, my rational, linear mind never wanted to do it. I never had that desire in my mind. But I, I got sent to this man and I could have been sent to somebody who could have put me on antipsychotics or overanalyzed my experiences so that they no longer had any life left in them. Um, as can sometimes happen with analysis. But I was sent to an angel who was able to see that a lot of what I was going through was be- because I really had to integrate my psychic uh, and spiritual self. And he was the first one who was able to see me and to see this. And he was able to look at me and sit across from me and not project and not see uh, who he wanted to see, but to see my essence. You know, it's what Coleman talks about, essence, you know, mm-hmm. getting to that, you know, being able to see with intuition in another person. I mean, it's a very beautiful thing. It's a healing uh, thing to be able to be seen like that. It was the first time I ever had that experience. And I hope you all have that experience. It's essential to have it. You know, and particularly if you want to go into therapy or you choose a physician, you have to have this capacity of being seen and not being projected onto us. It's intuitively, the, the feeling of being projected on, it feels terrible, you know, just subjectively. I can, I can feel it. It's somebody else's projection onto me, and as opposed to just being seen very clearly. So in any case, I, I was seen by this man, and he in turn sent me to see Dr. Thelma Moss at UCLA at the Neuropsychiatric Institute and she tested my abilities with a technique known as psychometry where you hold on to an object. I held on to her keys and I did a reading, a conscious psychic reading for the first time and I was quite accurate. It's an incredible experience. I mean you talk about not having to go from point A to point B to get somewhere. I had that experience where I was tuning into her house and I had the experience where I could just lift up off the ground and go up to the second floor. You don't have to uh, walk or you don't have to think in the ordinary way in, in psychic space. It just doesn't work that way. Or in dream time, it doesn't work. You, you look in dreams, you notice the next time you dream that the mouths are moving. You know, the mouths don't move much in dreams. It's telepathic communication. You know, people forget about it. It's something that they don't even think to acknowledge because it's so natural in a dream state. But when you go there tonight, when you go in dream, you just take a look. You see, you see, this whole thing we do about talking, I, mean, I love it, being human and talking. I love being human, but I also know the limitations of that and the beauty of silence. And anyone who wants to develop intuition, the first thing is to develop silence and learn how to be quiet within the self. Yes, if you're not quiet within the self, all you're going to hear is that mind blasting all the time. And that will torment you. It's really tormenting. If that's all you hear throughout a lifetime, is that mind. It's, it's not the softness of the heart or the, the sense of um, being cocooned or cradled, that intuition uh, and how that helps one connect with the divine, what that can give you. Now, I always teach intuition in terms of connecting with the still small voice inside as it connects to what you perceive as sacred, whatever you perceive as God. I don't care what you perceive as God. It makes no difference to me. But what does make a difference to me is that it's real for you and that in the middle of the night you can connect with it because only you will know that then. You know, it's an extremely personal thing um, who your God is and what voice speaks to you and who you choose to trust and how you know it's not projection, how you know it's not fear, how you know what is an authentic intuition and how to listen to it and when. I mean, your life can depend on it. It really can. Um, And you need to know it with every beat of your existence. Um, I couldn't imagine leading a life without intuition. I couldn't imagine being a doctor without intuitively tuning in to energy, to images, impressions, knowings, whatever comes to me. I mean, that's the joy of medicine. It's not just putting people in a little category and asking certain questions. It's about feeling them and being with them and also unconditionally loving them. And unconditional love is a conduit for the psychic. The more we can put that out, the more we can develop it in ourselves, um, the more we can develop intuitively. As intuition comes as a growth of the heart direct growth of the heart and as the heart grows you begin to see things and know things in a very different way all right and so i had a lot of support as when i went through uh, with thelma moss and i was beginning to really get in touch with my intuition and beginning just the early stages of trusting it it's taken me years to trust it implicitly as i do now it's taken me a really long time it didn't just happen where i trust it and my whole life was based around it 
Uh, but I did have a dream when I was working with her. And I had a dream uh, in which this genderless voice came to me. And this has been a guide for me since then. Um, and it came to me and it told me that I was to become an MD in order to have the credentials to help legitimize intuition in medicine, basically, is what it said. It was very matter-of-fact. A lot of intuitions that are most accurate and reliable are very neutral. It's simply information that comes through in a dream or in the waking state. It comes through like a transmission, very quickly, information. All right, I trust this, and I also trust the intuitions that come through with compassion. The ones that have a lot of emotion associated with it, I, I'm very wary of. And I always ask myself, what in myself is being activated here? There's always that question. And the whole issue of projection, um, as an intuitive, I can't afford not to deal with my own issues, my own psychological issues. Because if I don't deal with them, then I'm going to look at you and, and project everything onto you. And I'm not going to be able to read you accurately. And for that reason, I'm, as in my adult life, I'm in and out of psychotherapy. Um, because every time an issue comes up, I want to deal with it. I need to clear that out for me so I can see you and also so I can be free. You know, and what you said about the truth, you know, I have a great passion for the truth. A great passion for the truth. And um, intuition can bring you that. And anything that stands in the way of that, um, it can be fear, anger, insecurities, um, any kind of trauma you had as a child. All these things can stand in the way of the heart. And the hero's path, as I see it, is to learn to deal with those issues, um, the psychological issues that come up, so you can clear the way for more of the light to come in. You know, and, and so I, I look at that just as an intuitive. That's my responsibility, and it's my delight to be able to do it. And I, I really look at that as, as so important so I don't project onto other people. And so I had this dream, and it was at a time when I had no conscious desire to be a doctor. I had been raised around doctors, all of my parents' friends were doctors, and I found them to be quite boring. I didn't find any, really, I didn't, I didn't find anything. I was always attracted to artists, and I always wanted to write. I had always written poetry since I was a little girl. And so when this dream came through, it was very incongruous with what I thought I wanted, what my mind, the rational mind, thought I wanted for myself. And yet, I was trusting my intuition enough. So I enrolled in one course in a junior college just to see how it would go. And it was a geography class. Sometimes that's all you have to do, really. I mean, that's why I'm telling you the story in part. It's not just my story. And you open up the crack 1%. That's all you have to do. You don't have to totally have faith in what your intuition is telling you. But if you take the action to see, if you just give it a chance, then the mystery can come in and do its magic. Then the door opens a crack. Intuition or spirit, in my experience, isn't going to come and hit you over the head and say you have to do it. It just isn't like that. We're in co-partnership with the guidance that we're given. And if we say yes to what we're given, then we open our arms and move forward. If we say no, that's our choice. It's a missed opportunity and a price is paid for that. And I, I truly feel that way. And I don't feel that windows stay open indefinitely. There are certain windows that are open for a certain period of time, then they shut. And you don't have that opportunity anymore. But So what I did, I enrolled in one course. It was a geography course. It was the least likely course I ever thought I would like in the world. And, you know, it's funny because the teacher, he came in on the first day. I'll never forget this. Um, you know, teachers come in all kinds of forms. They don't just come in white robes and halos. They come in, you know, very simple forms. Simple. You know, those are the ones I trust the most, the simplest ones. And this teacher was very important to me. And he started talking about the night sky. And he started talking about the formation of the universe and the galaxies and the, the earth and the winds and weather. Because I've always loved weather. And the weather is so incredible. I hope you pay attention to weather. Great storms are very exciting. Um, anyway, so he started talking about all this, and I, my eyes just got open wider. And, you know, I, that was one course, and two, then five, then 14 years of medical training. <laughs> but that's how it works. That's how it works. And I also, you know, want to make a point that my parents had sent me to a career counselor um, about a year before that. I had been put through all these tests, um, these questions. You know, do you like gardening? Do you like um, working with your hands? Do you like working with people? No. Do you like listening to people's problems? No. But I didn't. I didn't. And this is, but this is really important to me in looking back because I didn't. I didn't want to hear your problems. I didn't want to work with people. Um, and, and then a psychologist came to me, and I'll never forget this. She said, whatever you do, don't go into the helping professions. <laughs> <laughs> so the, what is this? She was very intuitive. Is it very what? Intuitive. Very intuitive? 
Well, you gave her all the answers. I made the decision. Oh, she wasn't. Yes, no, it wasn't. This is counterintuitive. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> she was being facetious. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I don't know why, but I do. <laughs> you see, so when people make all these decisions based on the mind, based on the facts, it's all right, and I'm not in any way diminishing the power of the mind. But for me, it wasn't my truth. Spirit comes through in a different way, and it's very mysterious. And if your mind gets involved, if your ego gets involved and says, I have this plan, this five-year plan. People make these five-year plans for themselves. It's so amazing to me. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> it's just, I mean, it, in, intuition demands you live in the moment. That's one thing. And that's what I love about it so much. Because when you live in the moment, that demands that you're in a state of passion. Always. If you're in the moment, it's passionate. You can't help but be passionate if you're there. <laughs> if you're not there, you'll miss the passion. <laughs> so these five-year plans, I don't know. I mean, I guess you can approximate certain things. Uh, but if you're in the moment, that means you, you kind of let the moment carry you. And you know, Deepak and I were talking, I guess neither of us, neither of us plan what we're going to say <laughs> ever. <laughs> this is wonderful. I mean, really, as opposed to taking notes and trying to plan and, and, um, and, and so that dream, which seems so unlikely, was what really signaled my true calling. And the healing comes with intuition in many cycles. I had an experience about a year ago where I was speaking in Santa Barbara um, to this big audience. There were maybe 500 people there. And I was telling the story about my uh, geography teacher. And I looked down, and who was there? He was sitting in the front right row. <laughs> this man, I mean, he must have been about 85 now. You know, and I was talking about this man who meant so much to me, and he came up to me afterwards, you know, and he put his arm around me, and, and, and I thanked him so much, and then it was very clear to me, he, he had no memory of me at all. <laughs> <laughs> Did he have any memory of him? <laughs> <laughs> but he was so happy, he had made such an impact on my life, and I didn't even remember me. It didn't matter he didn't remember me, really. It matters that he made this you know, terrific impact on me and that this dream gave me all this incredible energy to get through all of that medical training, which for those of you who know traditional medicine, it's no easy feat to go through all that time. It's being indoctrinated into the linear mind, linear thinking, rational thought. No, but my saving grace in medical school, and this, you know, I've always been so thankful for this. The first year was horrible in terms of academic training and all the classes and, and trying to make my mind, which was so naturally intuitive, conform to a very linear, uh, linear structure. It was very painful and very difficult for me, but I did it because I'm very disciplined and very focused, and I did do it. Um, but the second year, where I started working with patients, you know, that has always been my great love, is working with people because then my intuition gets turned on. The minute I'm with somebody, then it starts to come out in and of itself. And it's such a beautiful thing because my intuition is used for um, basically love and service. That's why I use it. And I don't use it for any other purposes. And sometimes when I'm in a group, um, there's always some skeptic who might come up or, you know, with an envelope and say, well, if you're so psychic, why can't you read what's, what's in the envelope? No, they do that. They appear. that these uh, kind of witch hunter energy people who <laughs> When I first started getting out in public, I was unprepared for that, but it's true. I mean, they must have existed over millennia, really. They're just so adamant in disproving this. I mean, they, I mean, really, it's a, it's a force to be reckoned with, and I've learned a lot from dealing with that kind of force. But they, you know, hold up this number, and they create this, this problem in the group. And, you know, and I can never do that. I can never read numbers in an envelope, because that isn't what my intuition does. But if you put someone in front of me who needs help, then my intuition gets turned on and I can help them. I can read them, I can know exactly what to say and do to help them in the moment. That's my great skill as a healer. And so I use my intuition for healing. And so when I started working with patients and I was able to do physical exams and actually touch the body, touching the body is such a beautiful thing, really. I don't know how many of you do it. Uh, but it's very important to touch the body. And in my new book um, that I'm on book tour for, I, in every chapter there's a section on being in the body. Because so much of my intuitive growth has been making a commitment to being in the body 100%. And I, I didn't for so many years. I hovered you know, outside the body. And it stopped me from being fully present. And there came a time 
or I wanted to go deeper with my intuition and part of that required that I make a commitment to being in the body um, which, which is a very deep commitment for me actually and not to have one foot out the door you know, and, but to, to be 100% here in the body means trusting life as it unfolds in front of you and being prepared to deal with whatever it brings you you know, it's a great respect for life, this commitment to the body. And also listening to intuition. If we can listen to the intuition of a body, um, you can't go wrong. You know, if you ask your body you know, how it likes a person or how it likes a job, it will tell you, you know, instantly. It will tell you. Whether you listen, I don't know. Because uh, I, I work with a lot of patients, and the easiest thing about intuition is teaching them how to tune in. All right, the hardest thing is getting them to act. It really, I mean, I have patients who have the clearest revelations, the clearest dreams, and yet they decide not to act on it. All right? This is a big decision. When you have a revelation come in to not act on it, this is a huge decision in your life. And people always do pay a price. And one thing that I've learned is that whenever I listen to my intuition, everything good happens. And when I don't listen to my intuition, only bad things happen. I mean, that's a, that's a cosmic law, I think. But you have to know what to trust. And I think what you brought up earlier, now how do you know what's an authentic intuition? How do you know um, to, to enroll in a course in a junior college based on a dream? I mean, could you imagine? You know, could, would you do that? I hope so. <laughs> I hope so, but how do you know? I mean, that's what people are always asking me. And for that reason, that's why I've written a second book was to answer that and to give people um, kind of a guide about how to know, what to do, and to have a strategy for having intuition at your fingertips. I think it's so important not to have to strain to find it and to have it right there when you need it. And um, when you're around the deathbed, and the deathbed is the time when your intuition comes into play. It's, I mean, there there's no planning. You cannot plan around the deathbed. You have to go with your intuition. All right, and when you're at, you know, in that position, as I have been, um, as some of you know, for both of my parents, I've helped both of them die. And I've worked with a number of terminally ill patients, and it's just a great honor. And if ever you have the chance to do it, I hope you take it. To be around the deathbed, my intuition is what got me through. My dreams are what guided me through those kinds of situations to help people that I love the most. All right, but at those times, you don't want to be struggling to find your intuition. You don't want to be questioning, is this accurate? Is this not accurate? In that moment, you don't want that. You need to know and you need to act. Um, in those moments, you have to be quick at times. And so, um, if you develop intuition, um, and I, I use the, um, I ask myself, now how do I develop intuition? What do I do in my life? What do I teach my patients? And I came up with a kind of five step strategy to do it. And it, it really works for me, and it's very profound, but also five steps are, you know, just an attempt to, to loosely define the mystery. There's no way to ever really define what I'm talking about in a, in a certain sense. The five steps are just a structure for the mind to get into it. And they include listening to your dreams, uh, learning how to remember, interpret, and act on dreams. So essential. Now, how many of you dream? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a very powerful thing if you do dream. And if you don't dream, you can remember. And part of uh, remembering dreams is, is remembering who you are and remembering your spaciousness and the radiance of your spirit and how many things you can do beyond the mind. I mean, the dream space, every night you go to sleep and you dream and you're able to leave the body and travel. And uh, I'll just tell that little Coleman story because this was so great. Can not tell that? <laughs> he likes that. He wants to know. <laughs> uh, he, you know, he believes in his dreams so much. He's just such a powerful believer in dreams. And one night, he didn't have his dream journal by his bed, and he had this incredible dream. And so he wrote them down on the sheets. <laughs> <laughs> it's very wonderful, really. So listening to dreams, uh, learning how to ask for inner guidance, learning how to go inside and discern that, that still inner voice and know when it's authentic to know the signs to look for, to know when something resonates inside of you, to know the first-hand experience of intuition. Intuition is not of the mind, it's of experience. If you don't feel it, if something doesn't resonate inside of you, um, then it's not happening. Uh, something must resonate. The information either comes through in a very neutral sense, comes through with compassion, uh, or it comes through with a certain uh, knowing, an instant knowing, body knowing, that could come through as a transmission. 
All right, and so you need to know which ones are authentic. And you need to know what is an intuitive yes and what is an intuitive no. In the beginning, you have to begin to ask your intuition yes and no questions. Should I undergo this medical treatment? All right, let's say you have a question about it. Um, You have to go in, if you get a yes, it feels like a certain something in your being. For me, a yes is um, a movement towards um, being pulled towards something. It's a quickening. It's an excitement. Um, It's an energy. Um, It's a a sense that all is well inside of myself. Now that for me is a yes. Each person has to determine your own yes. And a no for me is a sinking feeling or if I'm trying to effort or push through a a brick wall and I'm trying to to do something that isn't a natural feeling. Or it could be a very negative uh, sense, like don't go here. All right, so you have to know yes or no. So you ask these questions, should I undergo chemotherapy? All right, my doctor's telling me to go to chemo, and yet there's something in me that doesn't feel right about it. Then you ask, should I go? And let's say something doesn't feel right about it, and then you get a yes. You ask the question, should I do chemo? And you get a yes. Then what do you do? (laughs) You know, I always defer to my intuition. Um, If something doesn't feel right in my body, I don't do it. I mean, that's just a general rule. And there's nobody who's going to convince me to do it. It must feel right to me before I go ahead. All right, and the way to know if it feels right is just to first learn this intuitive yes and intuitive no and practice it. Now, I've had so much experience over a lifetime in terms of listening to my intuition and practicing it. It is true that I I was born with a certain sensitivity. That is true. But through almost... um, two decades I've been practicing my intuition. I've been seeing where I'm accurate. I've been seeing where I'm off. I've worked a lot with remote viewing projects, which is a form of intuitively tuning in. And I've learned more from really where I've been off um, than when I've been on. And if you're first developing intuition, you have to practice. You have to get feedback from other people. If you pick up something, let's let's say with a friend, and you have an agreement, you're going to talk about it, um, then you have to ask, is this accurate? And they, they will either say yes or no, and that's instant feedback. So that's a way you know if your intuition is correct. The only problem with that, and, and I experience this with patients, is sometimes I could be sitting with the patient, I can pick up something I know is accurate. I'm very sure it is. And yet I talk to the patient, and they say, no, you're totally off. I say that. And at those moments, I just back off, and I just wait. It's not time. You don't push. You don't try and convince anybody of anything with intuition. I, convincing people has no interest for me at all. Uh, you can just say something, and if they don't go for it, you just wait until the right moment. And my intuitive process is that I tune in, and particularly with patients, not in social situations. Now, people have this, this funny fantasy that you know I would I'm tuning into everything about them, and I know all these <laughs> all these things, and I really have no interest in doing that. <laughs> no, it doesn't interest me. It does interest me not to do that, so I could have time off. You know, but people have these ideas that I have all this interest in tuning into them, and I don't. I don't. I have, I have very clear boundaries. You know, really, sometimes something will hit me very strongly. But usually, you know, if I'm in a social situation, I'm not tuning into anybody, you know, which, which is a wonderful thing for me. Um, but uh, my process is I tune in to get the information with patients, and then I tune in to see if it's appropriate to share it. And if it's not appropriate to share it, I'll keep something in forever. I will never tell them. If it's never at the right moment, I will never say it. I mean, to me, learning about timing is everything. It's not about me tuning into you and getting an accurate piece of information. That is useless uh, because it's about you. If I'm, if I'm uh, working with you, it's about when to say it to you and how. And learning kind of the art of communicating intuitively and how to say something so somebody can hear it. And if you're an intuitive, and if any of you are doing this work, you have to learn self-constraint. You know, I've seen so many psychics get into trouble because they're so impressed with what they know or don't know that they'll, they'll come up to you and they'll blurt it out to you. And it's very intrusive and very inappropriate. And they'll say, they could say quite serious things. I mean, they could say something like, you have cancer. I mean, I've seen that. It's, it's horrific, the damage that can be done. And people are very vulnerable. You know, and, and you know, when I wrote my first book, I made the mistake of using the word psychic in the book. As I was kind of naive um, because I thought people could hear it. And they really can't. I mean, most people cannot hear that word. It is too tarnished a word. Uh, Where the media goes with psychic is they go to the psychic phone lines or they go to fortune tellers. It's just an instinctual reaction. I mean, it's so tarnished. And, you know, for those of you who have ever considered calling the psychic phone lines in the middle of the night, no, there there are lots of people do it. Um, Don't. (laughs) 
don't. No, it's a terrible idea because what you're doing is you're putting out the most vulnerable part of you and talking to some stranger and you have no idea how skilled he or she is. I mean, they may be or they may not be. and It's just not a good idea. And you know, what, what I think is so beautiful about intuition is learning how to trust the self. When you have questions, to learn how to go inside and to know there's something very real in there. It's not as if you're asking nothing. It's not as if you're going inside and there's nothing there. And if you feel that there's nothing there, then that's the work to be done in meditation, in getting quiet, being able to feel what this higher self is. It has a certain spirit. It has a certain essence to it that everybody has. And training yourself to feel it and then asking it something, it's a beautiful thing. And you can take it with you everywhere you go once you have that confidence that you're going in and you're asking something very real. All right, but if you don't think there's anything inside, and I know from experience with patients, they come in, they don't think there's anything there. They don't. They think if I go in, I'm not going to get an answer. Who am I asking? They have no conception, a lot of people, that there's something so holy inside and so intelligent and so connected to the mystery. Um, And it's inside. Now, that's the thing. It's inside. And you have to go inside to find it. Um, And that's what people in the West are very unaccustomed to doing. They don't think there's anything in there. It's very strange. It's like it's empty in there. There's nothing in there. No, it's true. There's nothing in there. And you know, what my job as a therapist is, is to help them find, yes, there is something very valuable in there. And it's a spirit, it's an essence, it's an energy. And it's what I believe is you're going to take with you. All of us will take with us once we pass over. This is our soul growth. This is something, what we do, all the acts of goodness, all the acts of listening, all the acts of service and, and um, growth. This is what we take with us when we leave this body. Now, and this is the truly wonderful sacred work. Um, You might not take anything else with you, but you take yourself. And so by going in and finding the self, knowing it's real, learning that it speaks, and there is something there that talks. It talks. It has an intelligence. It speaks to you, literally. To get used to that reality and getting used to going inside, feeling it, communicating with it, and following what it says. Now, this is a very revolutionary stance as far as I'm concerned. Let me... um, Let me... From my point of view, I've been listening to you and trying to put it together. Uh, Let me summarize five or six things that I found useful and I'm putting together what she said. One, as uh, she said, learn to go into silence. Two, stop projecting. Be very aware of your projections. You know, we tend to always start to label and judge people and start to interpret other people's behavior from where we are and always ask yourself, you know, if I'm looking at this person as this, is this a mirror that actually I'm seeing myself in this person? Three, um, feel the sensations in the body. You know, one of my teachers was Maharishi Mahishogi. and, you know, in the early days before he became uh, too busy, um, people would ask him very personal questions. You know, what should I do about this? Should I invest here? Should I divorce? Should I um, move my location? Should I take this other job? And he would listen to them for a long time and then he would say, feel the body. His answer to every question was, feel the body, feel the body, feel the body. It's so much so that we adopted it as a technique. We would meditate and then for 10, 15 minutes after meditation, just feel the body. And you said that a little while ago. You ask questions, feel the body. See how you respond to other people by feeling your own body. And your body will give you the sense of comfort, discomfort, or whatever signal you get. Uh, but if you start to ask questions, feel the body, you start to get into this uh, inner voice, which is not a linguistic voice, as you said also. It's pre-linguistic, but it's very intelligent. So, you know, if I was to summarize the intuitive response, uh, it's, it's in the Gospel of John, when Christ says, Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. And who do you ask? You ask all four from yourself, but having cultured that inner silence, having cultured the ability to be in the present, uh, feeling the body, and trusting the sensations, 
and I, I would add one more thing with listening to you is uh, start to witness your dreams and listen to your dreams. I had a very interesting, can I share a story before yes, yes. I, I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> but this is a very interesting story about a little over a year ago I was in London at the Covent Garden Hotel which is a very nice, beautiful place to be in, in the middle of uh, the heart of London. And uh, the phones weren't working. And it was about 6 o'clock in the morning, and I was up, being slightly jet-lagged, so I decided to check my voicemail. And uh, soon discovered that the phones were not working, so I went outside the hotel early in the morning, misty morning, traffic jam, in Covent Garden. Yeah, I don't know how many of you have been to a London phone, phone booth. They are very beautiful red phone booths with glass windows. And the glass window was totally frosted with the early morning mist. Oh. I'm checking my voicemail and for no reason that I know of, I started to clear the frost from the, from the window took a piece of tissue and started to clear it. And I cleared up about uh, this much of space. And I, I, I just cleared this frost and I saw a woman passing by and she looked into that space. You know? And I immediately recognized her. And she said, Deepak! And I said, Eileen! You know, and she opened the door to, the, to this phone booth. And you know, I, to me that's very karmic, you know, that I opened this little space. And here she is, She's, she happens to be passing, and she looks into the, this and the space and we see each other. Anyway, Eileen Gregory, she's a friend of ours, she's the manager of a musician uh, by the name of Dave Stewart, who's a friend of mine, and he started a group called the Eurythmics with Annie Lennox many years ago. Very famous and wonderful person, has had all the kinds of experiences that you were talking about, near death and drugs and all of it. <laughs> 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 so anyway, she, she said, w so fancy seeing you here in the middle of a phone booth in the heart of London. I said, yeah. Um, she said, what are you doing for dinner? I said, uh, nothing. She said, well, you know, right, you see that studio over there? When she pointed to a little apartment across the street in Covent Garden. She said, I and uh, Dave Stewart and Annie Lennox are having dinner there tonight. And actually, Annie's been having some dreams and only yesterday she said to me if you ever meet Deepak ask him about this dream <laughs> so I said um, well let her ask me about the dream so we go to her house that evening and she starts to tell me this dream and the dream is that uh, uh, John Lennon is showing up in her dream and many years ago she used to actually be a groupie with the Beatles and was a friend of uh, John Lennon and he's telling her, I remember that song that I wrote, um, Imagine. You've heard that song, right? Imagine all the people. So, anyway, says, remember that song and remember how, uh, when I first performed it? Apparently she was there when he first performed it. He said, now it's, um, the new millennium is coming and you've got to write a new anthem and take it to a new level. And she's telling me about this dream and she wants me to interpret it and it's so obvious, you know, she's, she's, what she should be doing. But while she's telling me the dream, uh, a niece of hers, who's about seven or eight or nine, uh, but cranky little girl, um, <laughs> keeps interrupting her, you know, so she, she can hardly finish a sentence and, you know, this girl keeps interrupting her. So finally Annie gets upset with the girl. She says, now go and sit on that chair and don't you move from that chair till I tell you to do so. Hmm. And she almost pushes the girl, hmm. you know, with a little force. And the girl is pushed to this chair. She plops down on the chair and she plops down on the remote control and the TV goes on and John Lennon is singing Imagine. 
John Lennon, it's a black and white video, and John Lennon is singing Imagine, and we all look carefully <laughs> like this, and behind John Lennon, in that video, is Annie Lennox. Oh. <laughs> so I said to her, you know, you have your answer. <laughs> so there's a connection between our inner world of dreams and thoughts and feelings and emotions and memories and desires and karma and karma and this outer world of so-called space-time events. So start, before you go to bed tonight, sit up for two minutes, meditate and tell yourself, I'm going to witness my dreams tonight. Mm -hmm. And the yes. moment I wake, the, wake up, I'm going to write them down. Yes, and don't okay. talk when you get up. That's the secret to remembering. Stay quiet for five minutes. Because the minute you start talking, then you forget. And That's this, this so whole, true. Yeah, you have to be quiet and tell your partner, whoever you're sleeping with, that you're not going to be speaking for five minutes. <laughs> no, it's very, very important to do that. Is otherwise, if you start talking, then your linear mind gets involved and you lose the essence of dreams. But I just want to say something about yeah, your story ahead. because you, I mean, you, Deepak exemplified what it is to be in the moment, to notice every little thing. You know, I'm, I'm like that too. I love to look at every little thing, every little event, who's doing what and when and seeing the connections. And so if you stay open to all of that and you don't look at anything as insignificant, you just notice, you know, how things unfold. It is miraculous. You know, if you stay aware, people miss out on so much because they lose interest. You know, they don't follow it to the end, so they don't see because they're looking with their rational mind. Mm -hmm. But you have this essence of a child and so you're looking at every little thing. <laughs> that's, that's a wonderful thing though because if you want to tune into intuition, if you get back in that essence and you look at life as a as a miracle every little thing you know where the little girl sat on the you know the remote and then the TV oh my god you know it's just so amazing you know the, the, so many things have happened to me in my life but every time a new thing happens it's just as amazing to me I'm just as thrilled I never get bored with it never gets boring any of this you know if you just keep that sense of wonder well, you know one of the things I'm really interested to hear is you, know, you have this dream and then you've written it down or it's in your journal or whatever now, what's the next step? How do you go to that interpretation and acting on it? Well, I'll tell my uh, response okay. and you tell yours. Okay. Mm -hmm. You actually don't interpret it. You don't do anything. You just ask yourself, what does this mean? And then you wait in the present for an encounter or an episode or an answer uh, in the form of um, an inner voice but you don't actively do anything. You remain open, receptive, and uh, expectant and asking questions. What I do is I ask myself one question always when things like that happen. What's the karmic message? What's God trying to tell me? What's my higher self trying to tell me? Um, what's happening? That's all. And I don't, don't try to go after it. Do you want to say, add on something? I, I do. I think that's the essence of it. Um, but I, I have kept dream journals since I've been a little girl. I have them piled up. I write down my, I love dreams so much. I can't remember the daily things that happen to me, but I remember my dreams over a lifetime. And I have a very good memory for dreams. And so I write everything down, particularly if you want to document if you have a premonition that came true. If you write it down, um, since there's no time and no space on the intuitive level, sometimes it takes 10 years for a dream to come true. But if you have it written down, you have that dream written down, then the event happens, you can go back and get that uh, affirmation. And it's so important on an intuitive level to see it. I mean, to actually see, I dreamed this and it came true. Isn't this amazing? I have this capacity in me. So that's one way of dealing with dreams. Um, but also, you know, I'm a big believer in uh, water amplifying everything. And water and the dream state are, is, are very similar to me and the, the fluidity that happens with it. And so if you are in this kind of fluid state when you interpret, rather than getting uh, hooked into water means something, the moon means something. You know, it's, you know I always recommend uh, Man and His Symbols by Carl Jung as a beginning dream interpretation book. But with any uh, symbol that comes through in a dream, you can't hold fast to it. You have to intuitively interpret that symbol. You know, and just, just very quickly, I'll give you an example. I was going through a period in my life where I, nothing was working. Everything was falling through. I couldn't even get the plumber or the electrician. My every, nothing was working. Nothing. And I was getting very ungrateful. And I was complaining a lot to my friends. And so I had a dream one night um, that I was diagnosed with leukemia. 
and I was just so upset in a dream and when I woke up I was so happy to be alive that it was an instant attitude adjustment for me and I no longer you know felt ungrateful about being alive anymore how did I know that wasn't a psychic dream at that moment I tuned in and I asked myself is this my future and I got quiet I got in a neutral state and I got definitely no this is the universe you know telling you it's very healing you know wake up be grateful for your life and it's just when you have these dreams or you're diagnosed with a terminal illness I don't know if any of you have had this and then you wake up and you don't have it it's very liberating <laughs> <laughs> so I mean that's what I look at that dream soon after I had a patient who had a dream that she had leukemia and this happens as a therapist where I'll have a dream and often Sometimes patients come in with very similar symbols. But in her dream, her son was injecting cancer cells through an IV in a hospital room um, into her IV, giving her leukemia. And when she woke up, um, we did interpret the dream. Her son was an alcoholic and gambler, and he was living at home, and he was just leeching her energy. And um, she took from the dream, if she didn't take some steps and go into Al-Anon and work on her codependency issues and get him out of the house, that she would get ill. She looked at that as a warning, all right? And she feels to this day that if she didn't act on that, that she would have gotten cancer. All right, two different symbols, uh, same symbol, two different people. So, you know, that's an example of how you can't overgeneralize with any symbol. But I feel that by interpreting these dreams, it helped her to take action. It certainly helped me to, you know, change my attitude where someone could have sat down with me and nothing would have convinced me, but that dream was, you know, instant awakener. Nightmares. Ooh. <laughs> I love nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> nightmares are so exciting. I wrote a section on the book on nightmares because I think they're so important. If you have a nightmare when you're two years old, if you have the same nightmare when you're five years old, you have the same recurring nightmare when throughout a lifetime, oftentimes the volume is tuned up. And if you don't listen to it, if you don't take time to stop and face whatever that force is that's causing the fear, um, you can have that dream on your deathbed. And that isn't because your dream life is tormenting you. It's because you're, it isn't, but some people look at it that way. Um, it's because your subconscious is saying or your spirit is saying you need to look at this to heal. And the way to stop any nightmare is to look at it, find out what the essence is. Like if you're having a pursuer, a lot of nightmares, or you're being chased by a, a Nazi, you know, person or what, some evil person who's after you and they're, they're trying to hurt you or shooting you with machine gun bullets, you know, you must stop in your waking life and turn around and look who that person is. Whatever it is. And once you do that, the dream doesn't come back. So, nine, yes. Now you're going, maybe. You know, I'm saying yes. This is what I've seen as a psychiatrist and you know, throughout years when people deal with what's, what they're afraid of, what's pursuing them, it evaporates. It does. It's a very heroic thing to stop, you know, and say, all right, I am scared to death of this, but I need to look at it to free myself. So I'm a big believer in nightmares, in, in looking at the, the content of nightmares. I have a quick question. Um, the synchronicity actually intuition or well, when you, when you tune into your intuition, you get in touch with this invisible flow that's going on all the time in this, in this world and every other world that we're connected to. And there's this movement going on. If you get quiet, you can feel this kind of river flowing. And when you get in touch with your intuition, you get carried by the river. And once you get carried by the river, the synchronicities start happening and the deja vu is happening and you start getting in the flow of life. When you fight it, when you analyze it, when you try and stop it or resist it, then the, the experiences don't flow to the same degree. Yeah, I asked because I had an incredible, um, a continual uh, synchronicity. Yeah, intuition is, is an entry into the world uh, which is non-local. Non-local means there's, it's beyond space-time. And sometimes when many things happen synchronistically, you know, look at the word, synchronistic. Chronos means time, synchronos means many things happening at the same time. It's actually the simultaneous actualization of information in many places from the same point in the sub-manifest domain, from the soul, from the spirit. So it, the more intuitive you are, the more you'll experience synchronicity. Yes. But synchronicity involves many more things. You yes. know. I also realized how I go into, um, I had an errand to do, and I did it before the car wash. Had I done it the other way around, there was a chance I wouldn't have seen 
this, this fellow, because the timing could have all been out. Absolutely. So it, was, it was really, uh, it was a joyous discovery. It was yes. fun. Yes, well, the, the beauty of being here on this planet at this particular time, this isn't an enlightened planet. By the way, it is not. <laughs> I think we have to accept that. And I think part of our, our, gro- our soul growth is learning to make choices here. And with all the distractions, of course there are lots of distractions everywhere, but the challenge here, and it's such a magnificent challenge, is how much does it mean to come back to myself? What am I going to do? How am I going to fight for that to come back to myself? And how am I going to live that and be that light so other people can do it too? I mean, I think we have to deal with all the distractions. I totally agree. I mean, if you can think in the middle of a traffic jam, then you can meditate in the middle of a traffic jam. You can be centered in the middle of a traffic jam. You can be yourself irrespective of what the environment is doing. And we should never blame the environment or technology or the internet or, or, or the news media or the government or the forces outside because then we'll never be able to, to do, get in touch with ourselves. I think, in fact, it is, it is just a question of the quality of our attention and nothing more. People, you know, say, oh, well, now, you know, with all the technology, all the internet, I don't have time. I have to handle the hundred emails. Well, you know, you don't have to handle the hundred emails. Uh, Technology and what's happening out there in the world of science is all neutral. What we do with it is up to ourselves. We don't have to be at the, at the mercy of situations, circumstances, people, and events in order to find our intuitive core. Oh yes, and it's very practical learning how to tune in. I mean, I go, and I, I travel a lot also, I go into um, bathrooms and airports, I close the door, and I sit there and I meditate. <laughs> I don't care what people are doing in the bathroom. I don't care, really. I, what I care about is sitting down and coming back to myself. Then when I open that door, I'm back to myself again. You see, and I get a lot of joy from doing that. You know, I think that's a wonderful thing to meditate in an airport bathroom. (laughs) (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) Thank you, Dr. Judith Arloff, for a wonderful evening.